Hi, I'm Jay Bradford, Technical Solutions Architect with Cisco Canada, specializing in the Meraki product portfolio. The topic of our session today is Simple Sassy with Meraki. Over the next 25 minutes, we'll be covering things like what is Sassy and why should we? We'll keep it simple, Meraki style. And then if you don't believe me after all that, the proof will be in the pictures. Last, we'll wrap things up with the beginning. But first, what is it? S-A-S-E, pronounced sassy, which means absolutely nothing on its own. So it's time for the acronym decoder ring. That's better. Secure Access Services Edge. Pretty clear, right? I think we're done here. No? Okay, one more time with the decoder ring. Ah, okay, there we are. A consolidated architectural solution that provides effective and homogeneous levels of security and experience for users from anywhere on any device. You know, I feel like the acronym decoder rings kind of failed us here, and we're going to need some context to explain SASE. Let's back this thing up to yesterday. In general, this is what yesterday's architecture looked like. Resources and security were primarily hosted in the data center or maybe at a head office. Remote branches typically had access to these resources through MPLS or other private WAN links. And this was fine because there wasn't a lot of cloud being used, so backhauling through the data center didn't have a huge impact on performance. Remote users would be tunneled through VPN to the data center in order to get access to company resources and the internet. And remote access was also something you did after hours or maybe while traveling and typically wasn't the primary mode of operation for the bulk of your workforce. And from a security perspective, it was easy because the data center was the control point for all scanning and filtering of company traffic. But since then, three big changes have taken place, which make this data center centric approach less ideal for most businesses. The first is the gradual shift of applications to the cloud. This isn't a new thing. It's been going on for years, so I'm not going to talk about the whys of that happening. But it's this shift in service location that amplifies the changes created by change number two. The widespread adoption of SD-WAN, or perhaps more specifically, adding high-speed direct internet access to branch locations. And change number three, the mass exodus of workers from the office to their homes, which has been accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. In the data center-centric approach, these three changes mean you now have faster links coming in to get resources that aren't there anymore. So the traffic gets scanned, filtered, does a 180 back out to the internet, destined for software or infrastructure as a service providers where your applications now reside. And as you can imagine, this is very inefficient from a networking point of view. But because your security control point is still in the data center, it's necessary. All right, as organizations struggle to adapt to this shift, the challenges are things like complexity brought about by adding more gear, perhaps from different vendors in an attempt to decentralize access to corporate resources. This can lead to inconsistent security because you may be using different tools or policies for securing branches versus remote access users. And the quality of experience may have changed as well for some users for the better, but more often for the worse. And you're struggling to fix the problem because you now have limited visibility into key areas of the infrastructure exacerbated by an inconsistent access procedure based on location and client devices being used. Then the business comes along and tells you about a great new digital initiative that needs to be ready to go by next month, leaving your head spinning with all the bits and pieces you're going to have to bring together and test in order to execute. Ouch. I admit, this has been a fairly roundabout way of explaining an acronym. Shame on you, acronym decoder ring. But in this instance, 
the context is necessary. And now you should at least have a good idea of why a new architectural approach is required. So let me take another crack at this definition by putting sassy into a sentence. Businesses need a simple and consistent way to secure their digital resources, independent of how or from where they're being accessed. And no matter what type of service is used to make these resources available through a cloud-based edge. I know it's still a mouthful, but when I put it that way, SASE sounds more like a mission statement than a network architecture. And I think that's really the crux of why there's been confusion around what SASE is, because it's not a box or a thing. It's a journey. SASE describes the future end state of the architecture and implementing SASE will be a spectrum for most businesses, which will evolve over time. There are multiple factors that will influence how much of the SASE architecture businesses choose to implement and when like the vintage of existing infrastructure and outstanding service contracts. Geography. Companies can get better time to value if they're geographically dispersed. The size of the organization. More peeps means more work to implement. The industry, especially regulated, will need more time to vet and deploy SASE. Then there's corporate IT investment strategy. Is there budget for new IT spend? And what new things will be delivered in this way? And do those provide an impetus to move faster? And just like most journeys, there are stops along the way, phases, if you will. For most vendors, phase zero will span across the other phases with some either taking years to achieve this milestone or perhaps deciding to compromise on simplicity by relying on partnerships with other incomplete SASE technology vendors. This also means that phase one and two are pretty interchangeable depending on a vendor's existing portfolio. So if you have access to a current technology investment in SD-WAN, but the vendor lacks a cloud-based security offering, your SASE journey will start with SD-WAN. And after all the groundwork's been laid and pieces fit together, phase three will change the way you consume SASE by offering an as-a-service consumption model. Frankly, this will be forever out of reach for some vendors as they won't be able to offer all the pieces required to make as-a-service consumption make sense. Sounds like it could get messy, but worry not. We are going to keep it Meraki simple. The Meraki vision for SASE is that users, regardless of where they're connecting from, which devices they're using, what resources they're accessing, and whether those resources are hosted in the cloud or in the data center, have a secure, consistent, and dare I say delightful experience. Our framework to get you there conveniently aligns with the general phases I mentioned earlier. The first is Connect, where we harmonize the way sites and remote users access the network and the applications that run on top of it. Then there's Control, where we provide simple tools to apply policy in an intelligent and uniform way. And last, there's Converge, where we bring everything together in an as-a-service consumption model. Uh, remember when I said earlier that Sassy isn't a box or a thing? Well, that's still true six slides later, but there is an honorable mention. The Meraki MX Security Appliance. The MX not only consolidates your security by providing on-the-box scanning, but also brokers access to the cloud-delivered edge through SD-WAN. And because secure access includes remote workers, the MX also acts as a termination point for remote access via Cisco's AnyConnect VPN client. Add some secure access right there. Moving into our second phase, we need to control the flow of traffic to our services, whether they're cloud-based or on-premise from the edge. Meraki's auto VPN makes this type of overlay setup trivial. It's three clicks and the redundancy is built in. But what do I mean by the edge? This guy? 
No, don't think so. Yikes, I sure hope not. I'm getting vertigo just looking at it. Ah, that's better. Umbrella Secure Internet Gateway, or SIG for short. SIG's actually a suite of cloud-delivered services that include things like DNS layer security, a secure web gateway, a cloud-delivered firewall, CASB, and much more. It also includes SecureX, which integrates all the telemetry being gathered by your Cisco and third-party security solutions. No more logging in to multiple dashboards to try and cobble together the full picture of a security breach. Remember yesterday when you were trying to do all that stuff in the data center? Vaguely? Well, this is the sassy way of making that a distant memory. No matter how geographically dispersed your sites and users are, Umbrella SIG data centers are all over the world, so you have optimized secure access to services through the edge. You see what I did there? The best part is this is a true Meraki simple experience. All of the individual components I've mentioned integrate seamlessly through GUI and API. And during setup, you can choose whether you want to send all traffic to SIG, or if it's not critical, you can send it direct to its final destination. Where do we go from there? We converge the entire SASE experience and make it simple to procure as a service. So let's recap where we're at with the different phases. Cisco Technologies covering all aspects of a SASE architecture. Check. Consolidation of Meraki MX appliances and Cisco security stack. Check. Seamless integration of Meraki SD-WAN into the umbrella secure internet gateway. Check. As a service consumption model. Ah, coming soon. This is the most complete solution on the market with best in class technologies working together to deliver on the promise of SASE today. And now we're going to prove it. To help with that, one of my colleagues, Chris Riviere on the Cisco Cloud Security Team has put together a great demo that shows SASE in action. Okay, we're gonna kick this off in the umbrella dashboard. And over in network tunnels, you'll see we have an existing connector set up between Meraki MX and umbrella data centers in New York and LA. We'll come back to that later. Over to the Meraki dashboard, where we're going to set up a new connector for a branch site in London. To do this, we go to a new section called Cloud OnRamp. The first time you set this up, you'll input an API key to build a secure binding between Meraki and Umbrella. It's already been done. Under the Deployments tab, we can see we have that existing connector to New York and LA. And to create a new connector for our London location, we'll start by clicking Deploy and then assign a new name for the connector. Then we set the Umbrella Data Center in London as our primary with a backup in Paris since they're geographically the best fit for our new site. And that's all we need to do to make this SASE connector available to our SD-WAN fabric in the Meraki dashboard. What this does behind the scenes is provisions a virtual MX in both the London and Paris Umbrella Data Centers, which is dedicated to your organization at no additional cost. In a moment, we'll see those VMXs in our SD-WAN fabric setup. In the meantime, we can see our new connector has been built. And if we go to deployments, we confirm that it's going to London and Paris, just like we wanted. Now we'll head over to the SD-WAN fabric configuration in the Meraki dashboard under security and SD-WAN site to site VPN. Since this is a branch office, we'll choose spoke as our topology type. And then when we click on add a hub, we can see Ta-da! That we now have options to build our SD-WAN fabric to the Umbrella London and Paris data centers. We'll make sure they're set up the correct priority, click Save, and that's all we need to do to link our SD-WAN fabric with our SASE connector. Let's now head back over to the Umbrella dashboard. You can see our tunnels are now in Umbrella, but they're not quite ready yet. So we'll give them some time to build, and in the meantime, we'll go review our security policy. The first of which is data loss prevention. 
to protect customer credit card numbers from being exposed on the internet. It's been classified in Umbrella as a financial data rule, but there are a number of other built-in rules that can be used to scan for other types of sensitive personal information, like healthcare records, social insurance numbers, and so on. Next up, let's check out our web policy. This has been configured for knowledge workers. And first and foremost, you can see that the policy has been applied against an identity for the demo that consists of all the network tunnels we set up, linking our SD-WAN fabric to Umbrella with the SASE connector. Some other items in this web policy worth calling out are the customized block page that users will see when a rule blocks or intercepts their traffic. And the file analysis rule integrates with Cisco's advanced malware protection database to scan and block any malicious files that come through our SASE connectors and threat grid, which can sandbox unknown files for further analysis. There are also file type controls. And for the demo, we only have a few of those set up, including ISO disk images, and even Windows screensaver files. HTTPS inspection has been enabled, and that's crucial to get an in-depth view of about 85% of the web. Note that to have this feature work, your client devices need to have the umbrella root certificate installed. Under web security, we also have some generalized scanning services that protect you against web-based malware, phishing attacks, and other common threats. And then up at the top, we have a rule that warns users about time-wasting sites. The traffic isn't blocked outright, but the users are warned about the nature of the site and must click through to proceed. In this case, auction sites have been included in the rule. And below that, we also have a rule to isolate news, sports, and uncategorized sites through a remote web browser. This essentially lets the user access the content through a virtual browser hosted in the cloud. The idea being that the remote browser handles the content and is exposed to attacks, not the browser on the actual device. Okay, let's go check back in on our network tunnels. For the demo, we'll actually be leveraging the tunnels that were already online when we started, as this workstation isn't in London. But as they're all set up with the same policy, the experience will be the same. Green means good. Next, we're going to confirm that the demo workstation is not connected to Umbrella SIG. Perfect. That's Chris's public IP through his ISP in San Fran. Quick, everyone write it down. And now we'll connect the workstation to an SSID, which maps to a local network we're tunneling through the SASE connector. Our goal is to have our demo traffic be subject to the policies we reviewed earlier. All right, the new public IP we see sits in Cisco's data center in Los Angeles as part of the Umbrella SIG service, so we're ready to roll. First stop is to download an Ubuntu ISO file. Oops. Chris fat-fingered it and led him to a site that's a phishing threat. The devil's in the details, Chris. Ubuntu.com. Better. Now, let's see if we can get the latest version of Ubuntu. It's thinking. Now, our file type policy blocks the ISO and puts an end to Chris's Ubuntu dreams. That's okay, though, because our custom block page has a cute little avatar with his thumb down to soften the blow. Okay, but what about serious stuff? Let's try taking some credit card numbers and sharing them on Pastebin. That uh, sure escalated quickly, didn't it? Public service announcement. These are randomly generated fake credit card numbers, so don't think you could be buying that new iPhone on the sly. We're going to give this file a name. And as soon as we hit paste, our data loss prevention policy steps in and prevents the card numbers from being released into the wild. Uh, next up, remote browser isolation policy. If you recall, we put sites categorized as news, sports, and unknown into that rule. So we're going to go to bbc.com. 
The page loads as expected, but if you check out the bottom right corner of the page, you'll see that we've marked it with a small banner stating the page is isolated. Now any scripts or potential attacks are executed in the cloud rather than directly from the client device. Okay, let's go to my favorite, the time wasters rule. We're gonna check out Craigslist to see what kind of cheap junk we can pick up locally for a song. Hmm, as you can see though, the page informs us that we can go to the site, but it's against the company's acceptable use policy, so we probably shouldn't. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. I do it anyway. <laughs> nice, good man. Easy for me to say though, when it's his activity being logged and not mine. Which brings up a good point. What do these security incidents look like to the administrator? If we go back into Umbrella and head to reporting, activity search, we can quickly filter for events that triggered the acceptable use policy warning. It also tells us that those pages were allowed. Next, how about the isolated pages using the cloud-based web browser? There's the BBC request tells us again that the page was allowed, and the reason for isolation being the category of news and media. How about we look at some pages that were actually blocked? There we go, we see the paste bin page. And if we expand on the details, we're told that it was blocked as part of the DLP policy. Next on the list, let's have a look at the Ubuntu image from Ubuntu.com, which was blocked because we tried to download an ISO file. And then further down, the suspiciously convenient visit to Ubuntu.org. Wow, that's pretty impressive how far we've come in such a short period of time. And you know, the best part is this year, I didn't even have to do the demo. Thanks again for that, Chris. Much appreciated. Sadly, though, we have reached the end of our time together today. And besides, isn't it time for you to start thinking about taking the next step on your sassy journey? May I be so bold as to suggest a free trial along the way? Perhaps you're the studious type who enjoys reading material. No? More of a people person? Then we'd love to hear from you directly. Regardless of your choice, Thank you for attending the session today and enjoy the rest of Cisco Connect Canada.